Excuse me. Yeah, oh, I mean, What I want to do today is a bit different. First, I want to start by telling you what I'm not going to discuss, <laughs> uh, at least in the formal presentation, so to speak. But if you bring it up in the question and answer, I'm more than happy uh, to discuss. I'm not going to discuss the US uh, move of its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I'm not going to discuss Kim Jong-il, or whatever his name is, or what his future might be or might not be, whether it's like Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi or anything else. I'm not discussing the Iran nuclear deal and, and how grave a threat the Iranians pose to us, uh, being uh, putting their country right in the middle of our bases over there. Um, <laughs> I'm not discussing Syria and what's happening in Syria as important as that may be, another subject. But again, in the question and answer, I'm happy to deal with that. I'm not discussing this asshole. Sorry. I should start with the being nice. Uh, there's two of them, actually, there. But anyways, um, who are, uh, of course, starving the people of Yemen and bombing Yemen. Um, Last week, actually, we had demonstrations in Ramallah against the Palestinian Authority. I'm not discussing these guys, these characters, uh, who actually dragged some of my friends away. And 32 of them are still in Palestinian jails. Uh, they were dressed as uh, common people, but we know them as security, Palestinian security people. Uh, we can talk about Gaza a little bit. I will talk about Gaza. There were demonstrations in Jordan also. I don't know. This is just kind of rambling on the events in the past few weeks. Demonstrations in Jordan, both against what's happening in Gaza, but also uh, against the government for uh, uh, obeying the IMF World Bank uh, as a result of uh, it being accumulating debt. Part of it to serve Israel, uh, for example, the Red Sea, Dead Sea Canal, which costs uh, $15 billion that the government of Jordan has ended up with a debt on. I am not going to discuss religions, even though I think I like this cartoon. Somebody sent it to me this morning, so I thought I'd put it up. Um, it says, and I'm sorry, by the way, my angle here, you guys, somebody here is not going to see anything. Whoever might want to move and put a couple of chairs on this side. Um, or maybe I'll shrink myself a little bit. But anyway, uh, Jesus was not a white man or a blue-eyed. Sorry to disappoint you. Uh, <laughs> the economy is really worth a lecture of its own, of course. And the World Bank and the IMF, they usually put out figures like this that showed the GDP, average GDP of a country, that Israel, for example, is this much, uh, Saudi Arabia this much, etc. But that's average. Nobody makes that, actually. I don't know of any Saudi who makes $21,000 a year. Uh, they either make near zero or they make billions of dollars. Uh, and this figure actually illustrates it. You won't see such figures in the World Bank data of uh, income disparity in those countries. I'm not going to discuss also why uh, the economy is integral to war and peace in the Middle East. The fact that Gaza is being besieged has nothing to do with Hamas or any of that stuff. It has to do with these very rich gas fields that are off of Gaza, Gaza that Israel wants to keep. Uh, this is the real reason for the besiege of Gaza and the preventing of Gaza people from going over eight miles away from that. Now that I've told you what I'm not going to discuss <laughs> in the formal presentation, um, what am I going to discuss? And this is a very good question. Um, and thanks, Annabelle, for, for the introduction, which is, uh, which maybe is what I'll focus on, is how do we link nature, diversity of nature, to diversity in human societies? That's what I want to focus on. 
and I'm actually ri writing articles about this. I may end up writing a book about it. I have two more books, by the way. There's two of my books over there, but I have two more books coming out later this year, and then hopefully next year I'll, I'll do a book on the issue of uh, diversity in nature and diversity in, uh, in human societies. Now, Palestine is a center of diversity. Because of its geographical location, because of its geological location, because of its history, because it's present between Eurasia and Africa, even birds had to migrate through Palestine. And certainly humans had to migrate through Palestine. So, you know, and I appreciate the acknowledgement from Elsa about the Native Americans here. <clears throat> Native Americans actually are Palestinians. And you guys are all Palestinians. Why? Because you passed from East Africa when you went out into the world. You passed through Palestine. Now, some of us stayed in Palestine, hung around. And some of us continued on, including uh, what became the Native Americans as they crossed the Bering Strait and ended up in North America and South America some 12,000 years ago. Um, so. It is a very important location geographically, geologically, historically, religious, religion even, but as I, I, I promised not to talk about religion, so let's leave that aside. Uh, but anyways, it's also where humans developed agriculture, domestication of animals and plants first started in our region, that's a fertile crescent, where humans first domesticated things like wheat and barley, and chickpea is hummus. Most of you know hummus, of course. You don't have any Middle Eastern meal without hummus. Um, and that's what the people looked like, by the way, our ancestors. Uh, uh, before they called themselves Canaanites, we don't know what they called themselves, but uh, the uh, archaeologists call it the Natufian agriculture after Wadi Natuf, which is in the northern part of Palestine. And this is a reconstruction of a skull of an ancestor, Canaanitic ancestor, whatever. I think they got everything correct except the color of the eye. <laughs> um, but these are the Canaanites, as they are depicted in, uh, in hieroglyphics and in Mesopotamian also. Uh, culture, the people who had a rich land, part of this fertile crescent, who lived in relative harmony with nature, and who are just as indigenous as any other people on Earth. These are just some of the pictures of, of these people. My grandfather actually dressed like that gentleman in the striped uh, cloth there. And that's typical Canaanitic, by the way, uh, dress. For the woman, these uh, fancy embroidered clothes, etc. Um, this is actually a picture of my grandmother on my uh, father's side. Uh, and the only picture available of my grandmother as she was walking down the stairs from the old house. The Western Fertile Crescent is also because that's where humans developed agriculture. That's also where, once we developed agriculture and stopped worrying about hunting and gathering, of course, we had time on our hand. So, I don't know, we waged wars. <laughs> Uh, and we invented things like the alphabet and music and uh, laws and, and maybe religions and other things. Okay, so the alphabet that you use here, for example, comes from us, by the way. I don't know if you know this. The A comes from the Aleph, which is the bull with the two horns. The B comes from Beit, which is a house, a line and a half circle. You put it on its side, you get the Latin B, and so on. Now, the, the conflict, I'm not going to spend too much time because many of you are already familiar with the history of the current conflict. But this is a passing moment in history, and it's not a very significant moment, by the way. I'm sorry to say this to, you know, for those of you who watch the news here, think that, hell, these Arabs and Jews have been fighting each other for thousands of years and uh, whatever. No, I'm sorry, it's, it's a small conflict that started in the late 19th century. And before that, there was hardly any conflicts. So you'd have to go back to the time of the Crusaders to find another conflict. And then you have to go back to 600 AD to find another conflict. 
and in between, relative peace, nothing happening. Boring, if you want. <laughs> the media here loves blood and gore, so of course the media in the Middle East is focused. There is a conflict now, and we have to acknowledge there is a conflict, and you and I are unlucky enough to be living in this uh, period of conflict. And it's like the Crusaders. It's not an indigenous conflict. It didn't start among the people there, whether Jews, Christian, Muslims, or whoever was there. It started from Europe and came to us, just like the Crusaders. Uh, when the Crusaders came also, by the way, they, uh, the Muslims, Christians, Jews were living in the Middle East very fine, no problems. And it's not true that the churches were controlled by the infidels. No, actually, my ancestors, who are Greek Orthodox, had control of the Church of Nativity, the Church of the Sepulchre. All the churches were under control of our ancestors, the Christians who lived there. So what is this conflict about? Well, it's a very simple conflict. It's not very complicated to understand, by the way. Jews in Europe were discriminated against, and a majority of them resisted discrimination. A minority thought, well, let's go create our own thing somewhere. Blacks in America did the same thing, by the way. There were uh, blacks discriminated against. Many of them resisted discrimination. People like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Edwin Douglas, many others, but there were a few minority blacks who said, heck with it, you can't live with these white people. They have a gene to discriminate against us. So let us go create our own thing, and they did. You know the country they went and created in Africa called Liberia for liberty, for freedom. Of course, the problem for them, Liberia was not a land without a people for a people without a land. To this day, there's a conflict between the colonizers, the American blacks, and the native uh, people of that country. Same thing with this guy and Herzl and, and the people around him who created Zionism and developed it in the late 19th century. They realized that Palestine was full of people. 97% of the population was not Jewish. And how are you going to take a country that's multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious, called Palestine, and recreate it as a Jewish state of Israel? It's a problem, a conundrum that they had to face. And the answer was obvious. The native people had to go. And this was said by just about every one of them, like uh, Ben-Gurion, like Moshe Shavit, like Golda Meir, others, they, they said the same thing. I'm going to cut now a little bit of this history because I, you all know it. You know that the French and the British, for example, issued declarations in support of the Zionist project, the Balfour Declaration and the Jew Cambon declarations. And it was uh, during the First World War, and partly because the, uh, the Allies wanted the Zionists to help them bring the United States into the war, which I succeeded, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> but the bottom line is we Palestinians had to go. And uh, 500 and plus Palestinian villages and towns, which are shown in the red dots on this map, were wiped out. And today, 7.5 million of us are refugees or displaced people. And Israel was created on 78% of Palestine and took on the other 22% of Palestine, which is the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and proceeded to repeat the process of ethnic cleansing, uh, pushing people out and taking over and creating these settlements like you see here around my town of Bethlehem and squeezing the Palestinians into smaller and smaller areas. And we Palestinians ended up in about 8.3% of the land, which is worse than what happened in South Africa. In South Africa, it was 11.5% of the land that was dedicated to the black community. The shrinking land of Palestine is the same as what happened in North America. In fact, the idea of a shrinking map of Palestine came to my son when he was 13 years old. And he developed this shrinking map of Palestine, which you may have seen before. Uh, and, uh, and, and it came to him because he saw the shrinking map in the United States, which you see at the bottom. This is colonization, 
And colonization is not a nice word now, but it was a common word. It was used by all the early Zionists, from Herzl to Ben-Gurion, everybody else. Uh, you know, Jabotinsky, etc. Colonization have certain characteristics that uh, are very well familiar to you all, and I don't have to go through them. They have certain symptoms that we don't have to go through them, including how the colonizers perceive themselves and how the native people perceive themselves. Uh, okay, if this is the case, let me step back on here. What is, so, so this is kind of all introduction. I told you what I'm not going to tell you, and then I told you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but then I told you the main thing is colonization. Now what? We can sit here and lament and say, you know, God bless the Palestinians. They are like Native Americans. And maybe soon they'll be selling us embroidered stuff. And maybe soon we will be making speeches about them like what we heard earlier. Or we can say there is something different, or that the world can be different, or that we can envision a better world, or that we can do something about it. And I can tell you, actually, in our case, I'm very optimistic. The, you know, of course, when I was in the US, I even participated in demonstrations you know, in, with Native Americans, et cetera. And I don't give up on Native Americans. but. But Palestinians have a much better chance. Um, why? Uh, if I'm in the medical genetics field, and I say you look at other patients, and you look at the current patient, and the strength of that current patient, maybe his age, his uh, physique, his, uh, whether he has other conditions or whatever. And based on that, you can make what we call a prognosis, right? So we had the patient history, you heard about it. Diagnosis is colonialism. What's a prognosis? Well, colonialism, there's only one of three possible outcomes. There's the Algerian model. I don't need to tell you about that. You know it. There is the Australia and US model. I don't need to tell you about those. Genocide, basically. And there is the rest of the world model. Those first two models, by the way, are very rare. You find them in very few countries. The rest of the world model is clear in South America, Central America, Caribbean islands, Mexico, Canada, you know, Brazil, Argentina, Southeast Asia like Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Taiwan, uh, South Africa most recently. Uh, what's in those situations? People just live together. They even marry each other, by the way. And you cannot even tell now a Mexican person uh, whether he's an illegal of an ancestry of, Austri of uh, Spanish or an illegal of an ancestry of native, according to Trump. Uh, but anyways, um, this is the reality. This is the outcomes. Which outcome do you prefer? Which outcome do we prefer? I think it's very obvious. Most of us prefer that third outcome. And just based on probability basis, that's what's going to happen, right? And that's part of my optimism. The other part of my optimism, which is a major part of my talk, is about the fact that in nature, diverse ecosystems are longer lasting, are healthier ecosystems than ecosystems dominated by one species. Okay, And uh, this is an important feature to realize, by the way. Uh, the same for human societies. The, uh, by the way, when Israel demolished those 500 plus Palestinian villages and towns, including uprooting all their trees like uh, figs and almonds and olives and carob trees, etc., what did they plant instead of these? They planted European pine trees. It's almost metaphorical, by the way. Monoculture. So monoculture was very unstable. And today, when you hear about uh, uh, fires in the Galilee, which now they call northern Israel, which I don't recognize, by the way. It's northern Palestine, but that's another story. Uh, monoculture is not healthy, okay? Uh, an ecosystem that diverse is more healthy. 
whether in plants, whether in animals, also in humans. So when we talk about diversity of human societies, we talk about a strong um, society that is continuously evolving, by the way, and doesn't mean that it's static. The reverse, actually. Every society that is diverse continuously recreates itself. This is a part of the reason why we say uh, about people who want to kind of reclaim the past, make America great again, so to speak. Uh, what is the notion of that? That's like going back, you know, you cannot recreate history. You know, yes, America was mostly white at some point, <laughs> but you cannot make recreate history. I'm sorry, it's, history is past, <laughs> it's gone. So you have to recognize that these societies evolved. And a diverse society like the United States evolved and moved on. And now we have people of various backgrounds, including people like me, whether you like it or not. I'm a US citizen, OK? <laughs> so, <laughs> and by the way, just for the record, uh, my father is Greek Orthodox. My mother is Lutheran. My wife is Chinese American. My son was born in Lubbock, Texas, so he's a redneck uh, atheist, <laughs> if you want. <laughs> My uh, sister went to Utah and became a Mormon. God bless her soul. <laughs> I have cousins who became Muslims, and it's wonderful. It's a wonderful life, OK? <laughs> For the life of me, by the way, I never understood people who want to be just with people just like themselves, you know? It's sick. It's boring. Why would I want to be with people just like me? I don't even stand myself sometimes. <laughs> so it is natural to, to have diversity, to have these uh, variations of ideologies, of religions, of backgrounds, etc. And Palestine, by the way, was like that. Even North America was like that, by the way, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Native Americans were not one religion or one language or one this or one that. <laughs> they, were, they were diverse. So we are diverse. And diversity is strength. And diversity is what will make, will come back again in vengeance, by the way, in the world, I assure you. And people like Trump will be looked at in 100 years with ridicule, like, how could this have happened? Already they are doing that, but <laughs> ridiculing him. Um, this woman, for example, were diverse, diverse religions. This is 1920s Palestine. Uh, this woman in the white hat, by the way, was a Protestant woman. There was a Catholic woman there, a Muslim woman, some of various uh, conservatism, if you want. But it turned out, actually, when we investigated this, pic this picture, the two women here with the full veil were doing it as a prop. They were going to meet with the uh, high commissioner. Um, they entered into the high commissioner office, of course, and he had his wife there. And, and this is a British soldier when they were meeting with him. And they said, we are here to object about the Belfort Declaration, about the British occupation, about the Zionist plans in Palestine. I said, OK, would you have tea? And they said, no, we don't take teas uh, from our enemies. Uh, and then these two women suddenly lifted the veils and looked straight at the high commissioner. I said, we want you to see our eyes and see how serious we are. <laughs> it was just a prop, you know. <laughs> but anyways, um, this is a group of religious leaders in Palestine, 1932. And they were gathered to do the same thing, to object to the uh, Balfour Declaration, and object to the British occupation of Palestine. This is Matthew Muganam again, the same woman who was head of the uh, uh, Women Union in the 1920s. She wrote a book eventually called uh, The Arab Woman and the Palestine Problem, published in 1936. She would be like the Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King of Palestine, I think, in retrospect. People will look at her in such a value. But anyway, you can tell from the faces of these people and from their religions the diversity that existed in our society. You know, this is an Ethiopian, for example. The Ethiopians came to Palestine, and they integrated and became part of a society. 
the Armenians came to Palestine after the Armenian Holocaust, etc. And by the way, the use of the word Holocaust was done first for the Armenians. And they came and they integrated. We even have a quarter of the old city of Jerusalem called the Armenian Quarter. What's that about? You know, you give immigrants a quarter of your capital. Imagine uh, Trump giving a quarter of Washington, D.C. to immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyways, <laughs> he should, I think, but that's another story. <laughs> and of course, I paid the price for this, uh, for uh, speaking out against the Balfour Declaration and the British occupation. And here's four uh, Muslim leaders and two Christian leaders in British jails. And uh, when these girls, who are diverse, Christian and Muslim, uh, of in diverse backgrounds, some Armenian, some etc., go to school in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem. As you see, this is a form of resistance. Uh, and I'll show just some pictures of resistance here quickly, but that's not the subject of my talk, so I'm just going to flip through these various forms of resistance. Well, maybe I'll stop at this slide because this is the price you pay for resistance. Uh, since 1948, over 100,000 Palestinian natives have been killed. Over 800,000 have been injured. Over 700,000 have been detained and imprisoned, including myself. And in the last few weeks, as you know, with the marches on the Gaza border, many more were killed, uh, 140 so far, who lost their lives in the past uh, eight weeks and uh, over 10,000 who were injured in Gaza. But these are pictures of some of the people who lost their lives, including a medic, Razan Najjar, including a person who had lost his legs uh, already in, uh, 19, uh, in 2014, who was also targeted and killed with snipers. And uh, uh, children like this one who was shot in his back, um, even a baby, eight month old, who died from inhaling tear gas at a demonstration. Press people were shot, etc. Yesterday, actually, in the midday, we had a demonstration in Connecticut at Fairfield, where you are from, <laughs> um, where, where we demonstrated in front of the Storm and Roger uh, uh, company that manufactures uh, sniper guns and sells them to Israel. Um, not only that, but Israel also loads their sniper guns with special bullets that do maximum damage, uh, like these what's called butterfly bullets that kind of expand and destroy a lot of the flesh as they go through it and the bones and everything else. And so many Palestinians have lost their limbs. In Gaza, actually, there's not enough medical services, there are certainly no prosthetics and things like that for people who lost their limbs. And, uh, you know, if I saw the picture of Ahd here. Ahd Tamimi, as you know, is a Palestinian girl who's now in an Israeli jail. Uh, I knew her and her family for the past 15 years, actually. Um, and Ahd, I, uh, uh, I know she was resisting when she was eight and a half or nine years old, uh, uh, non-violently, you know. Um, she slapped a soldier, and that's why she's in jail now, and her mother is in jail with her. Her mother is charged with posting things on Facebook, uh, including the video of her slapping the soldier, of her daughter slapping the soldier. But also her brother, whom you see in the picture there, is also now in, in the Israeli jail. And two of her cousins are in Israeli jails. And she lost two uncles who were killed by the Israelis. The family is just an amazing family. I think everybody who goes to Palestine should go to Nabi Saleh and meet with the, fam with the Tamimi family. This is a girl, her name is Emily Hankowitz. She's an American Jewish girl who came Actually, she, when she first came to see me, she said, uh, uh, my family is Zionist and I support Israel. Do you have any problem with that? <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, no, you're welcome. I can talk to anybody. I don't mind, you know, it's whatever. Uh, so, so we talked, of course, and she wanted to find out what was going on. 
I told her to be careful, of course, but she chose to go to the demonstration and uh, she was shot in the eye. Unfortunately, uh, she lost her eye and she is, uh, ironically, she's a visual artist and all she was doing in that demonstration was sketching. I have, you know, I've seen her book with the pencil drawings of the demonstrations and things like that. But anyway, since then, she and her family have become anti-Zionist uh, <laughs> because <laughs> Israel said, just like they did with Rachel Corey, whom you know was killed. I said, well, you chose to be in a war zone. What war zone? There's people demonstration under military occupation. This is not a war. This is a military occupation. People are demonstrating. They have a right to demonstrate. So anyways, um, this is Rachel Corey, by the way, when she was killed. She came to my village of Beit Sahur, actually, where we trained her in nonviolent resistance, and she went to Rafah, where she was killed. Um, this is a friend of mine, uh, Basim uh, Abu Rahma, who was killed by tear gas that crushed his heart, a uh, canister. And then I went to his funeral, and a month later I also went to his house. His sister Jawahir actually showed me the room which they have kept the same way. But unfortunately, she herself was killed by inhaling tear gas at the same demonstration. Um, this is me being arrested a few times. You see my t-shirt there? Got human rights, Palestinians don't. And I'm grateful for this soldier who gave me this excellent photograph <laughs> to, pro to prove I am right. <laughs> um, anyway, this is the last friend of mine that I lost in the struggle, Basil Laraj, who's from a village called al Walaja. Uh, and I have so many friends in al Walja. al Walja is like my second village, I consider it, because I go there all the time. And uh, al Walja is besieged, and there's a wall being built around it. Uh, settlements have taken most of its land and, and all of its springs, basically, water. And here, Basin and I are in front of an Israeli bus stop. Uh, we called it, actually, Palestine uh, Freedom Riders because we were trying to show how Israel is an apartheid state. I, as a Palestinian, even with my American passport, I'm not allowed into Jerusalem. Whereas any Jew in the world, including converts to Judaism, can come to Bethlehem, live on stolen Palestinian land with government subsidy, and freely move around anywhere they want to, including go to Jerusalem, or use the airport in Tel Aviv, or whatever. By the way, that airport is also from, stolen from us. I don't know if you know that or not. Uh, it was called Lud Airport. It was built by Palestinians in the 1930s. Against the wishes, by the way, of the British government to rule Palestine at that time. They really started building it and pressured the British government to allow it to be built. And then Israel was created in 1948, and they took over that airport. They renamed it Tel Aviv Airport. And then they expanded it and renamed it Ben-Gurion Airport later when Ben-Gurion was dead. Um, so, and you know about BDS. I'm not going to talk about BDS. OK, so we talked about uh, the patient history very briefly. We talked about the diagnosis, which is just one word, colonialism. We talked about the prognosis, which is pretty good. Uh, and we talked a little bit about the resistance, which is a form of therapy, right? So this is the big picture, if you want. What's the small picture, which Annabelle and others uh, are familiar with, those of you who came and visited with us? is that we are trying to build a center in Bethlehem, which will be like a, an oasis of resistance, if you want, in the middle of this mayhem of power and politics and violence and all of this. It's an oasis that brings people and tell them what? Tell them that you have it within you to, to really do whatever you want in your life. So we bring children in. And the motto of the museum is respect. Respect for ourselves. As Palestinians, we can change our own circumstances. 
and respect for others, regardless of their religion or background or where they come from or ideology, even if they are Zionist. As I said, you know, I had even 55 Israelis come. They're welcome. They can hear and they can maybe change their mind. And if they don't, God bless them. Let them do what they want. Um, but it's a dead end road, as I explained to them. It's not going anywhere. Uh, so that's respect for others. And then respect for nature, animals and plants that are around us and how we, we do it. And the museum focuses on research, education, and conservation. Research is number one because we need to research our environment to be able to, to do proper education, etc. Uh, I like this image. I don't know where I stole it from, so excuse me. It was off the internet somewhere, and I lost track, and I can't find it anymore to give credit to whoever made it. But I like it. It's kind of symbolized what I really uh, believe we do. And uh, those of you on my email list, by the way, know that I end my emails with stay human, um, because that also I stole from another person. This time I know who I stole it from. It was Vittorio Arrigoni, an uh, Italian activist. Uh, but anyways, um, and, and I don't know where Vittorio got it from. I'm sure he got it from somebody else. <laughs> but anyways, that's a good idea about meme. It's like also I showed you that the shrinking map of Palestine was invented by my son. But don't worry, no copyright. Use it freely. You don't have to say who originally. Good idea spread. It doesn't matter. So. Becoming more human is the central part of it. And what do we mean by that? Here, we have to understand that they, when uh, Mr. Linnaeus named us Homo sapiens, uh, he had wishful thinking, you know? <laughs> and maybe someday we will reach that name that we, was given to us, to our species. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, we have to work on it, and we have to work on it every day, and I think it's not an easy job. Uh, so, so becoming more, that's why I like this figure, it doesn't say stay human or whatever, it says becoming more human, becoming more rational, more logical, more uh, whatever. But also recognizing that humans, what distinguishes us from all the other creatures on Earth, is this brain that had the straight line of size that kept growing year after year, decade after decade, million of year after million of year. And this brain is important. We cannot ignore it, so we have to use it. And, uh, and that, to me, is, uh, and most people don't use it, unfortunately. Just see Donald Trump do this movement, mocking the, uh, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I saw that, mocking the handicapped person, you know. <laughs> What, does he have a brain? I don't know. It's very strange, you know? Um, but, but this is the, you know, this is, in my opinion, something we all have to work on, not just Donald Trump. Me too. Okay, everybody has to work on it. And every day I wake up to say, hey, what can I do better? Where can I, uh, uh, you know, have more joy, more creativity, more community involvement? This, to me, is very important. More hope, by the way. Hope is very, very important. Maybe it should have a bigger slice of that pie. Because without hope, how are we going to do things? Action here is, is a big part. And that girl, Razan Najjar, who was 21 years old, the medic who was shot, by the way, on her Facebook page, uh, it was a brilliant woman. Uh, on her Facebook page, the last entry, or next to the last entry, was an entry that says, uh, I'm writing to those who keep criticizing us for going in the front line for doing these things. I tell them, you will never understand unless you actually come down with us and see what we do and act with us. And then just one day, and then you will understand why we put our lives on the line. <laughs> And, and I thought about it. What does she mean by that? She means that action is actually what leads you to better understanding, right? And Basil Laraj, by the way, in his little insert that he put in a book that was like a will, people consider it a will, but it was just more of a, you know, kind of his thoughts. 
He said, you know, uh, I've, uh, the reason the thought was a will is because the way he, write, he wrote it. He said, I looked at, uh, at uh, what martyrs have written before they died, their will, and etc. And I found that they're usually very pithy, a few lines with no substance, no. And, and I was thinking, why do they do that? Why don't they write something profound that illuminates for us the way and whatever? And then it dawned on me that their actions is much more than any words could ever, could ever, uh, you know, articulate. <laughs> and that's it. So people thought that what he meant is he's going to go and do something that will result in his death. But I don't think so. I think it's just a, a random thought. He had a lot of these random thoughts. I even have some of them uh, saved. Um, OK, so in my point of view that I want to, to illustrate is what is the role of us humans in nature? Is it the role of us, like the Israelis did here when they drained what they called the swamp of the Hula, which is the wetlands, which many migratory birds pass through, and they drained it and supposedly to make it uh, green and uh, develop this, and in the process caused 119 species to disappear? or when they uh, maliciously diverted the waters of the Jordan Valley uh, to create, uh, supposedly, the Israel water carrier that deprived the Jordan Valley of water and resulted in desertification of the Jordan Valley and also the shrinking of the Dead Sea, which now, supposedly, they are going to fix the shrinking of the Dead Sea with this Dead Sea Red Sea Canal which adds $15 billion to the, to the debt of the government of Jordan. And it's a horrible, horrible idea, by the way, to, to do this canal between the Red Sea and the Dead Sea. I don't have time to explain the ramifications of this. Is that the role of humans on this earth? Is the role of humans to continue to dump carbon dioxide and, and uh, liberate the carbon from its <laughs> stores into the air? creating global warming, and in our case, that will result in two to four degrees increase in temperature in Palestine uh, and decrease in rainfall by 20 to 25 percent. Is our role to take a hill like this, like the Israelis have done in 1997, including land from my own relatives, by the way, in Beit Sahur? and take it, they used to go there to study nature, catch butterflies, collect snails, and <laughs> et cetera, and, uh, and to make it into this concrete jungle. Is this the role of uh, humans on, on Earth? Uh, is it to dump our toxic waste on other people because they are not God's chosen people? Uh, Israel puts its most uh, polluting industries in the West Bank, uh, which cause genotoxic effects for our population. We studied this with my master students. Is it to do this, to, to uh, take water from one people and give it to uh, immigrants? 91% of the water of the West Bank is taken by Israel, uh, causing us severe problems with water. If they distribute it equally, by the way, there's plenty of water, but they are not going to distribute it equally. Uh, or is it to coop people up like they did in Gaza, two million people in this open air prison that, because of the gas fields that they want in Gaza? Um, so that these 2.5 million people, uh, soon, by the way, it'll be 2.5 million people. Um, these people will literally starve and have problems. Um, what, what, is, what is it that, or, or is our role to respect this diversity of animals and plants around us, which we study at the museum and we publish papers like this one. This is uh, Muhammad Abu Sarhan, is actually an undergraduate student, and he published this paper when he was a freshman in uh, college in biology. And the second year, he published another paper on the grasshoppers of the West Bank. And now he's in Italy, by the way. He finished his bachelor degree early, and now he's going to finish master's degree in Italy. Uh, 
This, this is the diversity that exists in our region. It's very rich diversity. And, uh, and if we don't do something now, now, as we speak, it really doesn't matter if scenario one, scenario two, or scenario three of colonialism materializes. <laughs> Because all three, if we don't protect our nature, will end up with a catastrophe on us. Okay. I told you I prefer scenario three, and I think that's what's going to happen. But we can't wait for that to happen. I cannot wait another 20 years, or 10 years for that matter, before we start thinking about the environment and how we can protect the environment. So that's why I feel the urgency. That's why. Uh, basically, uh, we publish research papers on, on these things. We go to the field, we study them, we do experiments in our uh, museum in the garden, for example, like aquaponics, drawing, uh, you know, growing fish and vegetables in the same system, uh, or teaching our children the value of looking and observing and developing critical thinking. Uh, Chinese have a saying, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. So the idea is for them to touch things, feel things, and this way they can understand more value of these things. So the girls, for example, here were engaged in recycling trash to produce gifts from it, or recycling paper and things like that, or touching and feeling and observing and enjoying these uh, processes. Uh, here we even had the kindergarten kids' dresses, butterflies, to really think what does a butterfly need uh, in order to survive. We take them on the field to teach them to love Palestine, love land, and protect the land. So we have the t-shirt here that says respect for the environment is respect for ourselves. You see the little American flag on the t-shirt on the front? <laughs> This, was, this project was funded by the US consulate. I hope they are not regretting it now. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> no, I was honest with them. I said, you know, you know what I'm doing is teaching uh, children to love the land. And, and to me, this is a form of resistance. I wrote this in the proposal. I was surprised that they funded it, but anyways. <laughs> um, and we get a lot of internationals, as you heard, come and uh, uh, stay with us, eat with us, enjoy themselves. We have opened the museum to the public in April 2017. We hope to open the Botanical Garden in 2019. And we hope to open the Green Building in 2021. Uh, I already secured funding for the garden, so that's on track. I'm working now on funding for the uh, green building, and I actually managed to get $400,000 for that. Hooray. <laughs> and uh, I need another 600000 So if one of you has a rich uncle, uh, please let me know. <laughs> but anyways. Um, OK, now here where I kind of sum up uh, my old professor at the university in uh, Texas Tech who died recently, unfortunately, Robert Baker. Uh, used to tell me, you know, when you give talks, you should tell people what you are planning to tell them, and then you should tell them, and then in the end, tell them again what you just told them. <laughs> that way they will remember. <laughs> but anyways, um, basically, I mean, the bottom line message, and, and he said something else which I always remember. He said, somebody comes and wakes up one of the audience people at 2 o'clock in the morning, and asks them, what did this guy tell you? They should be able to say in one sentence something that's relevant, that's the key point that, that this person wants to give. So my key point is this. The colors of the Palestinian flag are multiple colors. Black, red, white, green. And by the way, the tables here, when we ate dinner, they had those four colors on them. I happen to, my favorite color is none of these. My favorite color is blue, by the way. But would I want to have my garden full of blue flowers? It would be boring, you know? I love a blue flower when it's surrounded by other colors that give it highlight, that give it strength, that make it make sense, you know? 
So diversity, again, is strength. And I, I emphasize this point more than anything else, is that I really believe that we have to rethink society's structure and respect for the other and inclusion of the other and having pluralistic societies. And for those who support uh, you know, the one religion or the one skin color or the one this or the one that, uh, I'm sorry to break it to them that uh, the <laughs> history has moved on. You know? And these things don't last. I mean, the Nazis lasted in power 12 years. Uh, South Africa lasted with apartheid trying to maintain blacks separate from whites for, I don't know, 130 years or so, uh, which is long. The Crusaders lasted 120, 130 years. That's another reason why I'm optimistic, because we in Palestine are also about that age. So <laughs> it cannot last much longer. So I really encourage us to rethink our uh, positions and what we fight for and how we fight for it. And, uh, and we have to do it, in my humble opinion, in a way that keeps the doors of the tent open, so to speak, even for those who oppose us. I can tell you stories about this because I did succeed even in converting some Zionists to come our way. Uh, and we can talk about that if you want. Uh, but that's the bottom line of my message if you want. And if somebody wakes you up at 2 in the morning, please tell them diversity. <laughs> One word. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, by the way, the reason I'm here in America now is because uh, we got a National Geographic grant, which is amazing. It's the first grant for Palestinians. And uh, I met actually with the president and CEO of National Geographic. This is a huge organization with billions of dollars that they spent every other year. Uh, and, uh, and they gave us a grant. It's not a big grant, it's $29,000. But it was very important and symbolic that for the first time they give a Palestinian uh, institution a grant from National Geographic. And not only that, they have this annual National Geographic conference in Washington, D.C., so we applied to go there, and I accepted. Uh, but. It was very important because the people there from over, like there were 300 people from over 110 countries. And most of them have never heard of Palestine or environmental issues in Palestine or any of this stuff. Not only that, even when I registered for the National Geographic uh, to go to the conference, they didn't have Palestine listed on their web. <laughs> Scrolled down, looked under Palestine, not there. Looked under O for occupied Palestinian territory, <laughs> not there. Anyway, uh, I get calls from Israelis and emails, for example, telling me there's the German trilateral something or another that supports collaboration between German, Israeli, and Palestinian scientists. And we have 200,000 euros. If you want them, we can give them to you. And I say, sorry, I don't co cooperate with Israelis. We don't. We obey the BDS rules. So if I want to compromise our principles, I can, <laughs> we can have lots of money. Uh, but I found out that you can do a lot. You, can, you know, as I tell my students, you know, when you put your mind to it, you can do anything you want. I mean, I'm not allowed to Jerusalem, by the way. Next week, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm not allowed into Jerusalem, even with my American passport. But I violate Israeli law. Heck with them, you know. Uh, we can write. They can't stop us from writing. Uh, we can publish. We can uh, communicate. We can give lectures. You know, they can't stop the internet. It's, uh, I think Zionism really needs to understand that they have lost. Sorry, but they have lost past tense, not win lose. It's just a matter of for us to convince them that they have lost. So I, 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 if we think as winners, we will be winners. If we think as losers and we throw our hands up in the air, this is what we call mental occupation. 
I wrote an article. If any of you is interested in this, I have a book coming out uh, from Rutledge called Post-Colonial uh, History. And I have a chapter on mental colonization in, in that book. If anybody is interested in this chapter, I can send it to you as a PDF. You can read it. It's, it is amazing that mental colonization is actually more dangerous than physical occupation, more dangerous than any destruction they can do to us. If they convince us that there is no hope, then definitely we will have no hope. If, the, if we think as free, then we're free. There's a story about that. I told it in Connecticut, by the way. One time they took me in this dungeon, basically underground, a hole in the ground, basically. And, and uh, there's no bathroom, and there were 15 of us. There was actually Basil Laraj, the one I showed you a picture of with the T-shirt that says boycott divestment sanctions. And his aunt, actually, Shireen, was there. And we were in this hall. And there's no bathrooms, and it has stinks. The place stinks because it's underground, no ventilation. And there's a soldier up there, and there's a fence around this hole, this ditch, basically. And there's a soldier there with a gun. And I'm sitting and talking to these young people. And the soldier says, stop talking, like that. And then I kept talking, and they kept talking. And then he cocked his gun, pointed at me, and said, stop talking, like that. And so the young people were afraid. I wasn't afraid, but you know, I didn't want to jeopardize them. So I started singing and dancing. <laughs> and he looked at me like, didn't I tell you stop talking? I said, yeah, but you didn't say stop singing and dancing. <laughs> so <laughs> he was like, look, and uh, kids couldn't help it but laugh, you know. And even him, I noticed a little smile on the side. <laughs> So then I said, listen, if you don't want me to talk to these people, can I just come and talk to you for just two minutes? That's all I need of your time is just two minutes, and then I'll do whatever you want me to do. He said, what do you want to say to me? So I walked up the steps halfway. I didn't want to threaten him or anything. And I said to him, you know what? Uh, you speak good English, so let me just say to you, you know, what I really think. Uh, part of the reason I I'm talking or dancing or singing is take my mind off going to the bathroom because I'm not going to go in the bathroom in the corner there, with especially with the lady in the house and these young people. And I'm a professor at the university and things like that. I teach biology and stuff like that. But that's not really what I want to tell you. I want to tell you something more important. He said, what? I said, I'm more free than you are. He said, what? I said, I'm more free than you are. I came here by my choice. I knew exactly that I would end up here. I, I went to this demonstration in al and we were standing in front of the bulldozers, and I knew I would end up here, because this is not the first time I end up here. And I know you guys will keep us here for torture for two or three hours until the investigator decides on his uh, whim whether to uh, sit with us and ask us a question, interrogate us or not. Uh, but you are, you're not free, you cannot, you know, can, he said, no, I'm free, I can do whatever. I said, well, can you take off this uniform, go with me across the street, we can have a cup of coffee and <laughs> relax a little bit. <laughs> he said, no, well, I have to guard you with terrors. I said, see, you proved my point. <laughs> and this conversation went on for an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half, and then this soldier, we talked about everything, religion, culture, Zionism, everything. And eventually, the same soldier went to his commander and demanded that they let us to the bathroom. They let us, because at first he, he said, I will go to the commander and ask him to let you to go to the bathroom. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I don't go by myself. <laughs> you know, these people need to go too. So they had us go. And they, the only bathroom they had is the one for the officers. And the soldiers, you know, and so the soldiers were looking like, you're bringing these terrorists into the compound, to our bathroom? I said, well, go ask the commander. He allowed it. So, you know, this is to me is uh, mental freedom, you know. Uh, physical freedom is nothing. Walls and settlements and occupation and killings and all of this is nothing compared to mental occupation. Stephen Beekhuis, I think, said the same thing. 
that uh, uh, the best weapon in the hand of the occupier is the mind of the occupied. And in the civil rights movement, they used to say, free your mind and your ass will follow. <laughs> so, 